got in the helicopters and the airplane pilots go out here and said this thing makes you want to fly. But uh, it, it's obviously a totally different character. So it's kind of like family. Office on behalf of Edwards Air Force Base and NASA Armstrong, thank you for coming today. Uh, before we get started with the formal program, I'd just like to welcome our Ustream viewers back there at Armstrong. And just a quick couple of safety reminders. Uh, you'll see the green exit signs on both sides of the uh, auditorium tonight, so if there is an emergency and you hear some, uh, some sort of alerts, please exit outside. If you're here with a group, don't leave the center until you check in with your supervisor or other people so people can be accounted for. Restrooms are in the back of the facility. I would like to remind everybody who has one of these great little devices that has NASA technology on board, GPS, cameras, all sorts of cool stuff, please mute them. Uh, we don't need to show off what phone we have during the presentation, so please mute your cell phones. Um, for cleanup, we don't have custodial services, so if you brought anything in with you, please take it back with you, uh, especially if you have any trash. There is no eating and drinking in the auditorium, so please refrain, keep that in your backpack, and don't leave any surprises behind because we don't have a mop. Uh, we're going to get started here with a short video, but the uh, run of show today 
We will be playing a short video, then our Deputy Center Director will come up and make an introduction. Uh, then Mr. Hayes will come up for a, a, a brief presentation. We'll take lots of Q&As. We'll have two mic handlers in the audience. When you want to ask a question, you'll please go up to one of the mic handlers. And I do regret to say that we will not have time or ability to have any autographing sessions afterwards. Um, but if you do want to take a picture with Mr. Hayes, he'll be willing to do that. But please be respectful and not ask for any autographs today. With that, let me go ahead and queue up the video and we'll start our program. Thank you for coming. Fifty years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what is possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. A space launch system. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and stay to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The Moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing that our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the, the this, uh, Apollo to Artemis presentation. And in particular, I'd like to, to thank Mr. Fred Hayes for coming out and speaking to us again. As you saw in the video, NASA is returning to the moon. Uh, the Artemis program is well on its way, and by 2024, then man will return to the moon, and equally or more importantly, the first woman will step foot on the moon. And that's, that's a bold goal, 
and an audacious goal, and I think that's what the agency excels at. Uh, I look forward to sitting in my living room, as I did uh, many years ago watching the Apollo landings, to watch the Artemis landing. Uh, Artemis 1 will be the first vehicle, it, it will be an unmanned vehicle to demonstrate the booster in a prototype Orion capsule. Artemis 2 will carry astronauts to the vicinity of the moon, and then Artemis 3 will conduct the landing. So I think that's a, an awesome thing to look forward to. And these presentations are part of the uh, NASA and the agency celebrating the march to the moon, to return to the moon. As I said, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have Fred Hayes come and speak to us. Uh, he spoke to us a few years ago and talked about his career as a, as a research test pilot. Uh, he started as a fighter pilot for both the Marines and the Air Force, and later became a t pilot at uh, started at Glenn Research Center, which was Lewis Field back then, Lewis Research Center, and came to Armstrong, which was either the High Speed Flight Station or the Dryden Flight Research Center. I don't remember which which name we had at that time. Uh, he served as a backup lunar module pilot for Apollo 8 and Apollo 11. It skips one little thing on this item. Uh, is, nope, didn't skip it, it skips it later. Uh, Fred was one of the pilots for the approach and landing tests of the Enterprise. At that time I was uh, intern working up at Phillips Lab and got to watch those flights from, uh, from up on the lab, so I had the pleasure of seeing Fred fly those approach and landing tests. Uh, he was the lunar module pilot on Apollo 13 as, the as well as the backup commander for Apollo 16. Uh, among his awards are the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, NASA Exceptional Service Medal, NASA Distinguished Service Medal. And so I'd like you all to give a, a, a big welcome to Fred Hayes as he talks about his career. service of his country, both publicly and privately, as one of the most revered and respected figures in aviation and aerospace history. An integral part of the Apollo space program, Fred Hayes was a backup crew member on the celebrated Apollo 8, 11, and 16 missions. Hayes would become a household name, however, as a crew member of the famed Apollo 13 lunar mission a mission initially marred by trouble, but which ultimately stands as one of the greatest examples of human ingenuity, teamwork, and courage of all time. The Apollo 13 mission was an incredible journey, but it would be only one among many incredible journeys for Fred Hayes. Hayes received his Naval Aviator wings in 1954. While serving as a pilot in the Marine Corps, this Biloxi, Mississippi native also earned his engineering degree from the University of Oklahoma. Soon after, he began flying missions for NASA while continuing to serve as a fighter pilot in the Air Force. Hayes relocated to Dryden Flight Research Center in 1963, where he piloted many high-performance and experimental aircraft, including the M2 F1 lifting body aircraft flight research that contributed significantly to the development and design of the Space Shuttle Orbiter. Hayes' career would take an historic turn in 1966, however, when he would be selected by NASA to become one of the first 19 Apollo astronauts. Yeah, we've had a problem here. We've had a hardware race time. I don't know why. Why? Alright, here's the mission control. Apollo 13 will be forever etched in the collective consciousness of the world. For three days in 1970, Hayes and fellow crew members Jim Lovell and Jack Swigert fought for survival inside their crew module and on the world stage. Due to an oxygen tank explosion, the lives of the Apollo astronauts hung in the balance from the near beginning 
until the very end of the mission. Working closely with Houston ground controllers, Hayes and his fellow crew members ingeniously converted their lunar module into a lifeboat, saving precious energy and oxygen, and ultimately their lives. The world breathed a sigh of relief with the safe return and dramatic ends to the Apollo 13 mission. But Hayes would be far from ending his involvement in groundbreaking high-risk missions Missions that would help usher in a new generation of space exploration. After attending Harvard Business School in 1972, Hayes returned to Dryden Flight Research Center to work on a new reusable space aircraft being tested by NASA, the Space Shuttle Orbiter. In 1977, Hayes and fellow NASA astronaut Gordon Fullerton would take part in another series of risky proof-of-concept flying missions known as approach and landing tests. After years of research and development, the shuttle orbiter was finally ready for a real-life flight and landing test. In an effort to test its flight control systems and flying characteristics, the pilots would separate from the 747 and fly the engineless orbiter to a runway landing. The success of the approach and landing tests were critical for the advancement of the Space Shuttle program. In 1981, the Space Shuttle Columbia was successfully launched and returned safely to Earth, the first mission in an unprecedented 30-year history of the Space Shuttle program. In his 20-year career with NASA, Hayes logged over 9,000 hours in flight in more than 80 types of air and spacecraft spent over 142 hours in space, and took part in history-making missions that shaped space exploration as we know it today. With an extraordinary record of public service to his country, Fred Hayes retired from NASA in 1979. With his extensive technical, practical, and academic background, Hayes was recruited by the Grumman Aerospace Corporation as their Vice President of Space Programs. He would eventually become President of Grumman Technical Services until his retirement in 1996. Although officially retired, Hayes continues to make an impact on communities and people around him. As a public speaker, as a counselor for child burn victims, as a board member of Infinity Science Center, a nonprofit NASA partner formed to raise money for a learning center at Stennis Space Center in his home state of Mississippi. His achievements have been recognized from the White House to the Air Force, from NASA to New York City, from Hollywood to Harvard, and everywhere in between. Fred Hayes, pilot, astronaut, scholar, Businessman, role model, American hero. Good afternoon. I'm not sure I need to make my talk after all of that. <laughs> wow, what an introduction, terrific. Uh, Today I was asked to, I think based on the Apollo 11 uh, anniversary, the 50th year, uh, to tell a little bit about space, because when I spoke here five or six years ago, it was mostly about my uh, flying career with uh, NASA, and, but again, there was also a question to talk about challenges, and Apollo 13 hits part of that story, but there's some other things I was going to uh, talk about today. So if we can, if we go ahead, and I have to call the next slide, because this is also, uh, I understand, uh, being broadcast at uh, Armstrong Research Center, so people up there are watching this. Uh, so anyway, if you change the next slide, this is the uh, Form 50. It's uh, when I joined NASA at Lewis Research Center, and if you'll notice on the left, on the right side, the salary. I was a GS-7, making $5,430 a year. 
So I, I, I kind of knew when I joined NASA this was not a way to get uh, to, to become a millionaire. So, at any rate, next slide. Uh, just to briefly uh, about the time at uh, Lewis, uh, and incidentally, a little bit of why I joined NASA. Uh, I, my squadron commander and the reserves that joined the Air National Guard in Oklahoma, uh, Stanley Newman, had been an engineer at NASA Langley. And uh, I thought of actually applying maybe to companies to become a test pilot. And he suggested uh, NACA, at the time it had not become NASA yet. Uh, because at NACA, he said, you'll fly a lot of different kinds of airplanes. Because NASA research takes airplanes and modifies them to look at certain aspects, uh, either for performance or safety. And whereas an air, if you stayed in a, uh, with a company, they built an airplane, a new airplane uh, for the military, you'd probably be involved in that program for four or five years uh, before it really gets to flight. So you, you wouldn't fly the variety of aircraft. So that's primarily the reason I joined uh, NASA and Lewis. Uh, but just point out a couple of things at Lewis. We had this AJ-2, a Navy airplane, had a fairly sizable bomb bay, and we used it for zero-G. This happens to be the, the second zero-G program run in this country. The Air Force had the first initially at White Sands, and they moved it to uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base later using the twin engine, the conveyor, they were more testing people, just uh, for the same thing, the kind of things that are being done on space station today, obviously with a lot more zero gravity time. And we were testing fluid systems, like we tested the cooling system for the SNAP-8 nuclear power generator that flew with a couple of satellites. Uh, we developed the uh, tank configuration for the Centaur rocket. So we, we were not testing people, uh, we were testing uh, systems. We had a couple of uh, camp bearers. We actually had uh, one not shown here that was the first one built in this country. It was uh, one that had been built under a uh, uh, lease to, uh, uh, brought to England by Martin. And uh, it was the one with the little bubble canopy. And so only the pilot had an ejection seat. The engineer, if he rode, which you rode down to the below to your right. And he had to bail out manually. So I didn't ever fly many engineers with uh, on flights. But this one we used for a, a number of different th kind of things. Actually, a two-stage rocket was launched out of this thing uh, off uh, Wallops in Virginia to get to Mach 8. Uh, Lewis uh, was one of the um, early NASA proponents and developers of telemetry. And so that was obviously all supported by telemetry for those uh, uh, rocket stages. Uh, we also did some solar cell uh, research where you could fly at very high altitude. Uh, developing some of the early solar cell technology. Next slide. I moved on to uh, what was then actually wasn't Dryden yet, it was Flight Research Center, then became Dryden. And uh, at that time, uh, you see, I moved up in the world. <laughs> I was now making $9,475 a year. So I was, uh, I was getting up there. Next slide. Uh, there was a lot of aircraft uh, flying it in that day here. The X-15 program was uh, going strong. And uh, we, uh, 104, we had a couple of Air Force uh, 104s, and we had three uh, 104Ns that were used as utility aircraft, X-15 Chase, and in the sideline with other programs. We did some flutter tests for the, uh, what was to be the dinosaur program, the X-20. For every X-15 flight where it was launched, uh, the lake beds that it might use in case of aborts along the way had to be checked uh, before the flights. Normally we'd use a Goonie Bird C-47. Uh, we had a, a little a motorcycle on board. I think it was a Honda, I don't remember what it was, Don. But a motorcycle we could cl uh, climb out on and check up and down the lake bed for its surface uh, conditions to be used by the X-15. And we also did flights to check out the telemetry at the high range stations. Uh, and of course, in the morning of the flight, there normally was a weather flight that went to verify that we're ready to launch. Next slide. This was uh, one of the prototype aircraft. There were five prototypes built by Douglas, the F-5D, which was going to be the successor to the F-4D, uh, which was an operational Navy airplane. And it was, again, used for a variety of uh, tests. Uh, it actually had on board a system that represented the X-15 uh, communication system. So this is the primary one to go check the high-range stations 
uh, in readiness for X-15 launches. Uh, it, it also uh, flew a program, uh, the, the aircraft had speed brakes, for instance, uh, that come out of wings, up and lower and upper wings, that could be modulated, so you could put speed brakes at different angles. And uh, they were uh, added with uh, doubler plates, with holes drilled to give a higher drag, so a number of tests were done in the landing gear, incidentally, the, the, the strut and the, uh, mainly the door assemblies were beefed up to fly with the landing gear down to about 300 knots. So this airplane was used to see how low an LRD was capable, you're capable of flying still landing it just with the normal instrumentation. And with this thing, with uh, all of the speed brakes fully open, the landing gear down, and a little switch that popped open the nozzles on the afterburner that gave you three, about 600 pounds reverse thrust. Uh, we built up to an L over D of one, which is a 45 degree dive angle to the ground to land. Now, Bill Dana, who was then a, a pilot at FRC, decided he was gonna fly up another, an add-on to that program to see how it would work at night. Because the, the vision was that this would be Possibly that what would be the configuration you might have to land at that kind of LOD with a Martian return Because we were still into uh, thinking most things will come, come back from space and land on land and not go splash in the ocean But at any rate, he flew a night program at Edwards and started with a full moon and it, he could successfully do it there He went, Bill went down to about a half moon and it got kind of hairy so then we had a Gooley bird and a, another fellow at Flag Research Center, Colonel Kluber, scrounged some of these flares, artillery flares, under a parachute that you could drop. And we dropped one of those on one side of the leg bed out of the Gooley bird. And that gave a flicker because it was kind of swung under the parachute. So we ended up dropping two of those on each side of the leg bed. So it kind of ended up like day, which I obviously evolved into the a uh, large uh, system they developed for shuttle for light landings. In essence, you're back to landing in the daytime. Next slide. And another continuation that low LOD modified uh, <coughs> one of our Air Force 1 LOD. You see those little uh, things look like ears sticking out of the top. That was a monocular set. Again, Colonel Kluber got us from the U.S. Army that was used in tanks and put it in there. And that was to see, again, using an uh, artificial way for vision to see uh, fly these low LOD approaches. Next slide. And you saw our picture of this. If, if we had a light plane program. Uh, CAB had noticed an increase in uh, fatal accidents in a class of uh, light airplanes and asked us to do uh, evaluation. Don Malik, uh, here, here in the audience, the uh, test pilot at that time, started the program with the first aircraft and then Don uh, went off to do the early flights on the lunar landing uh, uh, research vehicle. And I handed the program over to me to continue. And we flew seven of these aircrafts, took, took them through full stability and control type test, and had other evaluation pilots we used to do under a special card we prepared evaluations to give us a, a pilot rating and pilot reports. Uh, this one we actually, uh, the, the, the Comanche, uh, was reported to us by Joe Tenchism. He was one of the founding members of the uh, Society of Experimental Test Pilots, an FAA chief pilot in LA. And there had been some fatal accidents of this aircraft, and one where the tail was observed to come off the airplane. So Joe had called, I think he actually talked to Paul Bickle, director at the time, and asked for a special test to be run on this aircraft. And that's what led to the set of flutter tests and the scene you saw in the introduction movie with that tail on that day we hit Flutter uh, it looked like a bird's wing flapping up and down that structure uh, and on board it was like riding a jackhammer for a little bit and uh, fortunately it mm -hmm. cracked inside internally in, the, in this, uh, that section in the horizontal stabilizer but symmetrically on each side and did not come off so I got it on the ground. But anyway, we ended up, I guess, buying that aircraft because we had leased it from a, from a private aircraft uh, uh, on a field base operator at Redding, uh, California. Next slide. Uh, this is a program where, again, being a junior guy, I was a junior guy in the office. Uh, Don Malik, I think, was two months ahead of me, uh, coming from Langley, and I came from Lewis. 
And uh, so I got the job to go to uh, prepare this aircraft, which was a special uh, bareboat civility aircraft for Calspan. And so I got to sit in February one month in a hangar without heating in Buffalo, New York. Uh, to set up all the test cases with this aircraft to, to make it emulate the uh, M2F2, the first heavyweight lifting body we were going to fly here at Edwards, and then and flew it out to Edwards to do some of the uh, test evaluation runs, mostly for Milt and the Bruce Peterson, who were slated to fly that uh, first heavyweight lifting body. Next slide. Now, I got credit for the M2F1, but I really only hit ground toes. Uh, it's one of us that is a, uh, I call it a gift. Uh, the program manager, uh, manager, after we were selected as astronauts, asked Joe Engel and I if we'd like to do some ground toes with the M2F1. So that's about the only work I did with the, uh, the real, we'll call it, first lifting body, the lightweight uh, lifting body. Now, Don got to fly it and get released by the 747 at altitude and actually uh, fly it all the way to the ground. Next slide. And then I uh, uh, joined the astronaut program. Now I have to say, uh, at the time, I had to think hard about making that uh, application. Because uh, I was having a lot of fun. And as I look back over my total flying career, the most fun I had day to day was here at uh, Edwards at the uh, Flight Research Center, now Armstrong. But just because, again, you flew uh, almost every day. You flew such a variety of, of aircraft. Well, I gave the talk here five or six years ago to sort of demonstrate that. I had, had uh, two slides that had, to cover, that had to cover one month of my flight log. And, in that, and I picked, obviously, that particular month. But in that one month, I had flown nine different types of aircraft in one month. So that was the kind of flying we were doing day to day, and normally you'd be uh, running one program, the chief pilot, and then you'd maybe be a subject pilot on other programs, and then doing so all that support flying kind of stuff. So it was, it was really a fun place. So I had to think real hard, should I join the astronaut program? Because uh, Neil had come back, I think Don talked to him, asked him about being an astronaut, and Neil said, well, you sit in a lot of meetings. <laughs> you sit in the simulator a lot. And it's not much good flying. So that was Neil's uh, <laughs> summary of uh, what it was like to be an astronaut. And it actually was pretty close to being true. Because uh, we had 38, so we used for taxi cabs to fly around the countryside. But that was you know, about the real, only real flying we did. So uh, anyway, I, I decided though would. Uh, if I'm going to get to go to the moon, and that seemed pretty uh, intriguing thing to do, if I stay here at Edwards, I'm not going to get to do that. So that's what uh, made me apply with the thought I might get a lunar mission. Next slide. Uh, at the time I was chosen, as part of a 19 that were chosen, this is the Edwards group. All of us were here at Edwards at this time. Uh, myself, I'm obviously on the left side. And Ed Mitchell, who landed on the moon on Apollo 14. Uh, Charlie Duke, who landed on Apollo 16. Uh, Al Warden, who was the uh, command module pilot on Apollo 15. And uh, Joe Engel, on the right. Joe, of course, had flown the X-15. In fact, is the, unfortunately, is the only person still alive that flew the X-15. All, all the others have passed that flew the X-15. Uh, so anyway, we were, uh, we were actually uh, all together here at Edwards in, in that, at that time. Next slide. Now the first crew assignment, which is a big deal, because once you, you, you work as a support crew after a sort of a, in our case, they needed us to go to work quicker, so we only got about a really good six months of rookie training, and then we got assignments to a support crew for various missions. But when you get assigned to a real mission assignment, that kind of puts you in the lineup. Uh, normally the way it worked, if you were a backup crew, you could expect to fly three missions later. That's the way the normal cycle was. And so my first assignment with us, the people dealing there, I was the backup on Apollo 8, and I, the crew was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and myself. Uh, 
Mike Collins had had a uh, medical problem, had been removed, and, and uh, Jim Lovell had moved up to the prime uh, crew on Apollo 8. That opened up the slot that gave me that position. Now, unfortunately, Mike got well. <laughs> he had seniority, so he came back in the lineup and bumped me. So I got to serve a second, uh, a second round. Next slide, please. As the backup crew of Apollo 11, which again put me now in the real cycle to, to get to fly for what we thought was going to be Apollo 14. Uh, circumstances were that Al Shepard and Stu Russo, who had been part of that crew with Ed Mitchell, only Ed had gone through a training cycle. So they decided Al and Stu should get more training time. So we actually moved up a mission ahead and ended up flying Apollo 13. Next slide. I should have known something was going to be different about Apollo 13, because this is the real crew that flew. Two and a half days before launch, due to the threat of measles, Ken Mattingly was removed from the flight, and Jack Schwagert replaced him as command module pilot. Now you might think that's uh, risky in some way, but uh, we trained equally as prime, as prime and backup. Uh, we trained equally, normally sharing the simulators morning and afternoon, attended all meetings together. So basically the, the idea was you could, you could, in fact, change out a whole crew if you needed to the week before launch. Because if you delayed the launch, you'd have to wait till the moon come around another month to get in the right spot. So we were, we were intent that we were going to fly, what that certainly wasn't going to be because you didn't have a crew ready to fly. So you did all the work, but just got to watch go somebody else go flying. So Jack, uh, the movie uh, that would cast, kind of cast Jack as we were concerned from the standpoint of him performing a mission, and that was not the case at all. It was obviously a very emotional thing for both parties to be changed out that late. Ken, because he's really starting to get the butterflies, I'm really going to get to go, and to be yanked off out of the lineup two and a half days before launch. And Jack, of course, didn't have to do some of the preparations to invite people to come to his launch, prepare his personal preference kit, those kind of things that he might have wanted to do that took some time. So he kind of got cheated on that side of it. Next slide. The liftoff here, the Saturn V, it, uh, it's, it's grand. Uh, actually, inside, you don't sense anything uh, from the sound of, point of the sound. Uh, at, at all, because you're way up on the tippy top. It's very impressive if you, I've, I've been there as a witness uh, to feel the reverberations of the, those five uh, engines burning uh, to shock waves that hit you. Uh, but inside, it's uh, pretty benign. You mostly hear the pump sounds running, the air hissing through the hoses, feed you in the spacesuits. Uh, the ride itself, uh, compared to my airplane experience, uh, is, is a little more jerking around. It, there, four engines that gimbal to hold it straight, the, even the little motion they make to steer the rocket are exaggerated because you're way up on the tippy top of that uh, big rocket. And so you get a lot of jerking around in the co cockpit, which is unusual from any aircraft motion uh, to some degree, except heavy turbulence, of course, you get it more vertical. Uh, but you get a lot of side to side even in this rocket. The G-levels were fairly modest, uh, the, the, the center engine shut down early, and the max G's on the ride were about four and a half G's. So compared to the fighter airplanes, uh, even the older ones, uh, Don and I flew and up, that, those, that vintage, you pull, you know, six, seven G's, combat maneuvering. I think today's fighters are up to eight or nine. So four and a half, one, that, and you're laying on the couch, which is an easier position to take the G's. Uh, it was pretty startling when the, those engines quit, though. When the first stage quit, it was like you're going to get thrown into the instrument panel because it's just very sudden. It takes a little while to separate, and the engines start then on the second stage to continue to ride. Next slide. The missions to the moon, uh, you went around first in Earth orbit, went around a couple of times. This picture you're looking at is uh, Baja, California. We're at about 110 miles altitude. And mainly, at the time was to look at things, in the systems in the mothership, command and service modules. So you looked at all the primary, secondary uh, aspects you could check to make sure nothing had been damaged during launch. Next slide. 
Then the third stage was started by people on the ground and that it, it, uh, accelerated the aircraft to a, uh, the, uh, spacecraft to about 25,000 miles an hour that let, let you leave the Earth, the balance of the Earth, and head out toward the Moon. Here you're probably at about 15, 20,000 feet. The uh, Earth scene you see there, the land scene, that's Baja, California again, and just above that you'll see a little white line of stuff on the ground. That's snow on the high Sierras uh, as we head it outbound. Next slide. And of course, as you go outbound, the Earth gets smaller. I know this is probably out about 50, 60,000 miles out, and even smaller as you go, next slide, out toward the moon. Uh, this now is a scene. We, we happen on this flight to loop around the backside to get a brief period of about an hour, coast it around the backside to come back home because of the problem we had. And the backside is a little different than the front side. It doesn't have as many of the dark areas. Apparently more of the larger meteorites, for whatever reason, struck the side of the moon we're, we're always looking at. Uh, this happened to be one of those features, though, and it was Tsiolkovsky. Uh, the Russians got to name things at first, because they sent the space, first spacecraft around the backside to shoot pictures, and so they got naming rights. And this one, Tsiolkovsky, was a Russian rocket designer in the early days there, much like Dr. Goddard was here in the United States. Next slide. Another prominent feature we shot a picture of, this is the Sea of Moscow, also on the backside. Next slide. A lot of the scenes on the backside are like this, so very uh, rugged, crater after crater after crater of all different variety, uh, where it's been obviously, well, through the eons, Billions of years constantly being hit by objects. Next slide. Zero gravity, as pictured here, somebody shot of me popping through the tunnel that goes between the two spacecraft, the lunar module and the command module. And uh, it was a very euphoric kind of feeling uh, to be able to float yourself around full of objects. You've seen lots of pictures of this in later missions with Skylab and, of course, today's space station. Uh, and in our case, it made the little cockpits we had to live in seemed a little bigger because you could use all the volume. Next, uh, next picture, next slide. This was just before the explosion. Uh, this is a scene, Mission Control is observing the TV show we staged to buy pictures there in the, on the, one of their screens. Uh, we did a show and tell and we kind of picked things to talk about that we knew had not been talked about before, and that's what we had done with Jim Lovell and I did this show from the lunar module. Jack Schweigert was mined in the store upstairs in the uh, mothership, and had were talking about these uh, things that, uh, incidentally, the TV show is not carried by any of the networks, because at this time, uh, going to the moon wasn't any big deal anymore. This is the third, third, it's gonna be third landing. Uh, Mission Control has joined it. Next slide. Now this slide is kind of busy, but I only talked to one column. That one says time from explosion to make, make a point. You can see that time goes down to 81 minutes till it has two crewmen to lunar module. So this is not uh, an instant life-threatening thing like running off a cliff. We had the explosion, we had the loud bang, we had some reverberations through that metal structure, uh, the two vehicles, some motion and some twisting in the tunnel area, and jet firings. The, the little 100-pound rocket engines were firing, trying to hold attitude. Uh, and that was about it. That quieted out a after a little bit, even. Uh, so it was not like we, uh, we were lose gonna lose our life in the next instant with this explosion. Uh, the most emotion I felt was when I got back up from the limb and coat drifted up into my couch position, which had all the electrical, communication, environmental system stuff. Looking at the meters, I knew we had lost tank two, oxygen tank two. We had two tanks, tank one, tank two. And uh, so it was not life-threatening. I still had thought I had second tank, but I knew immediately we had lost the landing mission. It was an abort. If you lose any one of a, a dual redundant system, you're gonna come home as soon as you can before the other one fails. And I was just sick to my stomach with disappointment. So that was my emotion at, at that point in time. Uh, but we went through in that period of an hour and 21 minutes, you see, troubleshooting because not too long afterwards, 
It wasn't apparent to us because we didn't have the uh, granularity on our, our content meters, but the people on the ground observed that the second tank, oxygen tank, was had a leak. It was going down. And so that time was spent troubleshooting uh, to try to stop the leak in the second tank, tank one. Now, I went back 25, 30 years uh, later and, put, just put, and pulled out uh, inner loops in mission control, which are not public, and I listened to the, that's where the expert at a given console talks to other experts across the hallway from mission control and when they were fighting this problem. And it came time to shut down the ship, down where you see CSM dead, and that was, that was at like 166 minutes. So that's, it was two hours and 46 minutes of fighting this battle before we actually shut off the mothership, or Jack did actually. Jim Lovell and I had left him to get the lunar module powered up. And uh, so, but talking, listen to him, a problem they had was when we got ready to shut it down, there was no procedure to shut it down. The command module was the, it was the mothership. It was never supposed to be shut down in flight. And so there was no procedure, but they were, they were professionally arguing about how to do it and not harm something. Because in their minds, they already knew that, knew that they wanted to get it powered back up to get us through entry. So they had not given up the ghost, the people in mission control at that time. So they were trying to safely get this ship turned down. And which they accomplished, as you see, at 166 minutes. Next slide. And this shows some of those people in mission control. Uh, there were a lot of furrowed eyebrows uh, that were under the gun through that period. Next slide. This is some of the uh, astronauts here looking at looking at the scene. For some, it was apparently some critical time we were doing a, a, a maneuver. And uh, they see Al Shepard and Ed Mitchell. Gene Cernan, Ron Evans, Joe Engel over there on the left. Uh, next slide. This chart now, for those that I hope they got the chart up for you at, at uh, Armstrong, is one that shows basically the trace of the uh, flight we flew to go to the moon from the Earth. Uh, basically, when the, when the uh, explosion happened at 55 hours and 55 minutes, uh, at the start of the problem there shown. Uh, we, if we'd done nothing, we would have followed the dotted line, which would have meant we'd have missed the Earth. We were not on a free return at the time. So the, the first maneuver we did at uh, 61 hours and 30 uh, seconds was the uh, critical time, because that was the one maneuver. We were using the uh, decent engine, we, and that was done fully computer controlled, automated burn. Uh, with the instructions that Mission Control gave us to get us back on a path to loop around the back side of the moon and generally be on a path that would get us back to an entry point back at Earth. We did another maneuver, actually that was the largest one we did at the so-called PC plus two. Uh, that was two hours past Parasythium, or the lowest point on the back side of the moon. And the longest burn we did using the descent engine, again, used fully automated through the computer uh, that cut 10 hours off the return. That put us back in the box on most of our consumables, electric and water. And the other two maneuvers we did, MCC 5 and 7, kind of were just tweaking the path to get us in the center of the corridor for entry, were both done manually. By that time, we had all the computers turned off. We were conserving power, so those were done with the way they told us looking out the window to get the right attitude. And then done manually with Jack Schweigert timing those burns with the decent engine on one and four jet RCS low 400 pounders uh, on the other uh, with a stopwatch. So manual stopwatch to start, start and stop the burns. Next slide. Now this chart was it's called a burn chart, we call it. That's a P-30 uh, limb maneuver. Use that some of this, uh, run the, that's what you punch into the disky, some of those numbers uh, to affect the computer burn. And, but at the bottom uh, is where I did a lot of head scratching because after that first maneuver we did to get back on the right path, Jim Lovell asked me to compute consumables. And so I just assumed the power down to about 18 amps on the 30 volt uh, main bus system on the limb. And in, the, what, in normal flight, if you're just coasting flight in the limb, you'd burn about 32 and a half amps. 
And if you're in a powered descent where you got everything running, including the radars, uh, you'd be at about 60, 62, 63 amps. So we, I figured we could go down to 18 amps. That's kind of a ballpark figure. I said, I, I know we can power down there and live off of that and have an environmental system and have calm. And I did those computations, uh, grocery store arithmetic down at the bottom and, and told Jim that I made it on electric power and I, I, made, I was short of water for cooling of the electronics primarily about five hours before entering interface. So I felt, well, we probably got a little margin there before anything really goes bad or wrong. So I thought we, we thought we had it made at that time. Now this was the mission time would have been longer. This was 150 something hours mission time to entry. We ended up with 146 because of that speed up burn we did passing the moon. Uh, what I missed though was the lithium cartridge. I did not think of the uh, getting the carbon dioxide out of the air that was building up. Uh, in, a, in a spacecraft, it's the same situation as on a submarine. If you don't do something about it, everybody in the submarine in its closed compartment, breathing out carbon dioxide out with each breath, you'll end up with a bad situation in a submarine and the same thing in a spacecraft. Next slide. So the people on the ground, again, another one of those uh, uh, bits of ingenuity, uh, a few more people I think involved in the movie and actually run in a chamber with human subjects in Building 7 at Johnson, fabricated this uh, square thing here using gray tape. We had gray tape on board. The gray tape was on board incidentally primarily uh, to clean the filters and the environmental system because of dust and stuff that may get on them. Occasionally you use the gray tape to stick on there to get dust and stuff off the filters. But it turned out to be handy for this purpose. And basically it's hooked up to that hose that's the intake hose into the limb environmental system. So they jury rigged this uh, plenum using some of our checklist uh, stiff backs and fronts and covers with a closed compartment tied to this lithium cartridge which is square from the command module where we had an abundance of those things. You can see the limb ones are right below and to the right. Circular, the circular holes. The, for whatever reason, uh, same, same environmental system, but the two vehicles had different lithium cartridges. The limbs were cylindrical, the command module ones were the square ones. But anyway, this fix worked, and from there on we ended up tacking on another, uh, just put on another square thing onto that one, and we could keep stacking them on to, to, for replenishing. That center area, which is taped, that helped, there was a hole through there, that was actually two pair of socks in there stuffed with that tape on that hole to keep co close, that, close that area. Next slide. Uh, sleeping, uh, I found a problem uh, sleeping if you, that I didn't have my arms uh, stowed somehow because if in zero gravity, if you don't, your arms tend to sort of end up with a minimum of muscle energy point and that would keep me awake and they kind of move occasionally. So I found a way to contain my arms. Uh, that was in my uh, shirt there, blouse, uh, not emulating Napoleon. <laughs> and my other arms are under some cables over here on the left side. Next slide. Another, this is another example of the uh, probably you wouldn't thought we'd ever have, but we had no blank paper. We had no blank paper on board. So we kept, for each of those maneuvers we did, uh, five of them all told, there was a little different set steps in the procedure. Now we did have a, a different writing instruments. We had a, a ballpoint a pen, a lead pencil, and a pentel. And so we used those in different ways to, uh, do, to do each of the redos of procedures uh, differently. Uh, next, to show the differences, next chart. Next slide. Yeah, you can see that and a whole other thing written down at the bottom of uh, rewriting uh, the procedures for the next uh, maneuver, next burn maneuver. Next slide. Now this was a shock. When we separated the uh, service module, uh, we saw this scene where that right side of the vehicle should look as shiny and smooth as that left side. That was where one quarter of the spacecraft had blown off. And uh, that's, then, of course, with the ruptured oxygen tank. And 
and uh, that, that was a real shock because the damage looked worse than we had, I remembered feeling. I mean, the explosion didn't seem that bad to cause this much damage, but I think part of that this was probably we were in the vacuum of space. So we did not have any secondary uh, shockwave effects like you would have if you were in the atmosphere, uh, like, like down here. Next, next slide. This was our farewell to Aquarius, the limb, the little module, where we got a lot of mileage out of this vehicle and worked uh, through, through the flight to get us back to this point. And uh, so we, we uh, separated it, and, and not too far before entry interface, and sort of kicked it off sideways so we'd get clearance uh, through entry. Next, next slide. And uh, splashdown. Kind of a miracle, secondary miracle of the program was this, uh, the condition of the spacecraft over those days was where it chilled down. Well, we went down eventually to 12 and a half amps on a 30 volt system. Uh, the uh, you think about it. That's if you have a sofa at home with two lamps at each end of the sofa, and you have a three-way light bulb, and you can turn it up to the third click. That's about the amount of power we were using. So it got very cold because there was not enough uh, thermal blankets to handle running at that low temperature. We could have been designed to run there, but it wasn't. And so it got very chilly. It froze the water tanks in the mothership. We had water we could see in the limb because the limb had no inner walls for weight. It was, it was a really a tough weight problem on the lunar module. So they just had netting material, which we could see through and see water everywhere. On the wall, water on every turn and bend in a wiring cable, it'd be a glob of water and at every new, uh, interface with a connector, be normally a little glob of water sitting there. So water from our breathing, perspiration and whatever, breathing out, it collected. The command module, when Jack Schweiger and I got in to power it up, another problem the ground had to deal with, there was no power up procedure by the mothership. It was never supposed to be turned off, and that normally was done on the launch pad with a lot of people. So they had to go invent uh, a startup procedure for us, activation procedure. Uh, so I, we got in the command line, was flying it, and he, but he, he flew it, automated through the computer, and we had the second most accurate splashdown in the program. <laughs> Only Apollo 10 did better. <laughs> Next slide. And this shows us coming on board the Iwo Jima aircraft carrier, which was pick, picked us up. That carrier had been in combat duty in Vietnam and they uh, had it swing south. It was on its way home to San Diego, its home port, and they had it swing south to uh, pick us up. Next slide. Uh, just some of the train vehicles. This is one at Langley, an LLRF, which uh, could sort of emulate the lunar landing. There was a big uh, girder assembly with cables. It was some, compared to the real uh, LLTV, at least I later flew, and Don was one of the early uh, test pilots that got it uh, verified. Uh, it was a little sluggish. There was enough uh, lag in the cable assemblies controlling this thing that you could feel that in the, in the handling qualities. But other than that, it still gave you a, a semblance of the task uh, to handle. He lost control of pitch. And when Joe ejected, he had one swing of the parachute before he hit the ground. So he was the closest. Stu Present was the third pilot that ejected up probably about four or five hundred feet. Straight and level, he just lost all electric power. And this thing doesn't fly good without electric power. <laughs> so, uh, next slide. Now, I, I, after Apollo 13, I went off and trained through another backup assignment on Apollo 16. And I had hopes of flying back to the moon on Apollo 19 at that time. That was the last mission, and I was in training with Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue, who were going to join me on that flight. And about five months in that training cycle, they canceled, because of budget cuts, Apollos 18 and 19. So 17 ended up being the last mission. So that's when I went off. I was in some program management, and I went off and joined Aaron Cohen for the next four years in the Orbiter Project Office. So I was in the early development of Orbiter uh, part of the shuttle from day one. In fact, I was on the uh, NASA source selection uh, that actually evaluated proposals submitted by four contractors 
to pick the winner, in that case Rockwell, uh, to build a space shuttle orbiter. And so I was more in a program management role uh, during those four years uh, with throughout design and development. I had a little spare time and I did some sport flying with uh, using these aircraft. These are Japanese look-alike aircraft. I flew mostly the Val Japanese look-alike Val dive bomber, which was a converted uh, BT-13. Had fancy pants on the landing gear you see there, emulating that aircraft. These were built by 20th Century Fox, and they used them in the making of the movie Toro Toro Toro. And what we did was we did air shows and used these aircraft for the first act of the air show was to stage the, the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. As part of the air shows, we had a lot of pyrotechnics out in the center field that people on the ground would set off to emulate bombs going off, that kind of thing. Uh, one day ferrying this aircraft uh, from uh, Angleton, Texas, where we headed at a crop duster field to uh, J uh, Shoals Field in Galveston, I suffered an engine failure at 300 foot in the air. I was wearing a parachute, but 300 foot is not good enough to go over the side in this kind of airplane. Uh, so anyway, I ended up putting it in what I thought was a, a reasonable area to land on the west side of that Shoals Field. And it turned out to have done some work preparing for added, uh, addition to a housing development. And one landing gear of this fixed gear, I couldn't raise the gear, went into a, a rough area a ditch and it cartwheeled, wing dug in, flipped over. I ended up going upside down backwards and it now is on fire. Next slide. This is just an artist picture of uh, those, those aircraft using that uh, uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. So I assume it's one of the, the, the probably storyboards they did and before they made the movie. Uh, next slide. This shows the crash scene. So I was, uh, and incidentally I ended up upside down backwards with the canopy shut. So I was on fire and I had to ro to ro to unstrap, uh, rotate and kick a hole through the, fortunately the World War II canopies wasn't like today's canopy so I could kick through and crawled out. And the fellow and his son met me from a, about a block over to the west. They saw this happen and came over to help me through a fence to get to their place where they had all, his wife had already called the ambulance. So I went into the uh, University of Texas Hospital at Galveston, uh, which is the nearest hospital at Burnham and elected to stay there. I could have gone to San Antonio to Brooks, which handles military government uh, burn cases. But I was going to, the, the way it worked at that hospital was the burn board uh, was a partnership with the Shrine Burn Institute next door for children. And uh, Dr. Larson, uh, one of the Shrine doctors I met almost right away, he was going to do the grafting. And so in his early training had been at uh, the Army Hospital in, in San Antonio for military burn. So I figured I had, had all the right talent and that way it'd be easier for family and friends to visit. So I just stayed in that hospital for the next three months. Next slide. And this is just my first day. It was a bad day because of the crash. I couldn't get any pain medicine for quite a while. They got me in the hospital, stripped me, stuck me in a stand-up tank to get the clothes uh, pretty much off of me what was left. And so I didn't get any pain medicine for about five or six hours. So that was a pretty grim period. Uh, next slide. And this is some of the uh, damaged area. Had arms and legs primarily, ended up with grass all the way around on the legs, which presented a problem. Next slide. And there's the legs area. The, well, I met with the doctors uh, pretty much within the first couple of weeks. I was classified clinical, mainly to see if I breathed any hot gases into the respiratory system, because if you burn that uh, bad enough, you're, you're not going to recover. Uh, and I got past that and I met with the doctor team internists from UT and uh, Shrine Doctors and I told them, I said, I'd like to get back to flight status. So what, you know, what do we got to do or worry about and what I got to do to get back to flying? And uh, the only thing that they proposed and, and did, we did do differently was when I had the grafts around the legs, uh, they don't want pressure on the grafts for five days. And normally they would have put pins through my ankles to hoist the legs up to during that healing process, and uh, I worried, we talked about it, and with Dr. Larson worried, I said, "Well, 
and said, I'd like to leave a hole or a gap in the bones. And he said, Pop, it's possible. I said, well, that may give me a problem with pressure differential. When I fly and go up and down, change in pressure. So we went a different approach and uh, got the, I got the suit techs involved at Johnson and they got sandals and they put Velcro on the sandals and they put a board they built to go at the end of the bed and I could clamp my feet into the Velcro. <laughs> so that's the way we got away from not having pins uh, through my ankles. Next slide. And the next gruesome slide of the legs. And next slide. And it was the arm area. Next slide. Now, uh, the, the, one of the things, you, the ritual you went through every day was you went into a Clorox bath, diluted Clorox bath. That was their way of preventing infections. And they had a big clock on the wall. They had 17 minutes in that bath. So you could no longer, you had to grit your teeth. Uh, it was a Hubbard tank. Uh, very carefully, they had you on a gurney coming in and a metal board, uh, metal on top of the normal gurney where they could hook up uh, hook, hook, hook assemblies and with a crane could hoist you in the air and take you over the top of the hopper tank and drop you in, which they had at body temperature. And so you, the nurses then could get into the hopper tank, which is kind of like a guitar if you think of it. So they could get in with tweezers and scissors to dip at me for a while, uh, getting dead skin and stuff cleared during that time. So, but Dr. Larson, would bring visitors. He'd bring them in his tank and he'd bring guest visitors he always had coming in from the Shrine Burn Institute. And one day this fellow, older fellow, came in with gray hair and uh, wearing a white coat just like a doctor. And he was introduced and he was from England. And he had served during World War II uh, at a hospital that had built outside of London over 500 beds. And he told me, he said, he said most of these beds, he said a lot of them, were our RAF pilots. He said because the Spitfire, unlike the Germans uh, and the Hawker, did not have self-sealing tanks. Uh, whereas the, the ma 109 Germans had self-sealing tanks, so when they got a bullet or a particular tracer into that tank, and one tank was right in front of the cockpit. He said automatically they did flash fire into the cockpit, so they got burned. And then of course they had to bail out over and generally drop into the English Channel, which wasn't very warm, uh, and suffer there till they could get them picked up. So anyway, those kind of things made me feel better that maybe, you know, I had one in such bad shape after all. <laughs> and another funny thing during that period, uh, I had, had a fellow a pilot uh, working uh, at Ellington. That was one of our check pilots for the T-38s, instrument, annual instrument check, that kind of thing, uh, rainy. And uh, I had kidded here one time and actually prepared an award because he landed a T-33 where the landing gear linkage was followed up and he ended up having to land it belly up with the gear up. And I made this special award of test, outstanding test piloting to test the undersurface of a T-33 as it <laughs> slid on the concrete. And uh, he shows up at the burn ward and he's got a big poster made and the big saying on it said, Hayes, you can't even commit Harry Carey successfully. <laughs> Low humor. Uh, but the good thing was, I did get back to plan after 14 months. I did a lot of physical therapy. I had a kinked up left elbow and the right knee. Took a lot of therapy to get back to pass the flight physical. And then was named, next slide please, uh, named to be one of the crews for the approach and landing test, which is shown here. Uh, two, two crews, uh, Joe Engel and Dick Truly, and uh, myself and uh, Gordon Fullerton, uh, shown here. This is at the Palmdale facility where Enterprise in the back of us was still being uh, manufactured. Next slide. And we got, I finally got some good flying though. This was good flying training. This is a shuttle trained aircraft, which through a computer could emulate the uh, space shuttle characteristics. It used reverse thrust for most of the approaches. It was the only airplane I've ever flown where it burned as much fuel diving into ground as it did climbing. Because it was almost pulled up to 90, 90 plus percent power as it's diving into ground. Next slide. And that uh, first day, that separation that was shown previously. Now, just a couple of comments about this. I've, I'll have to say that this was, uh, uh, I felt more pressure 
at this point than it had on Apollo 13 approaching uh, the space mission because so much was riding on it. Now, I was not concerned about uh, my physical uh, preservation. Uh, Gordo and I were sitting in ejection seats, so we had a, you know, a good plan B available. But I was worried about us hitting the 747 as we came off. We had done a, several uh, captive flights where we did not release to perfect the conditions where if we release theoretically by the load cell data, we had off the attach points, would say we'd go straight up. So we'd li not likely drift have to hit the tail on 747 because I worried more about Fitz, uh, Fitz Fulton and Tom McMurtry, uh, Vic Harton and Skip Gidry. They were the four people in the 747. And I knew if we went out of control at separation, because that's the first time we're going to get to see how the control system worked, or if we hit the 747, they would be lost because they did, they did not, they were not sitting in ejection seats. So that was my, call it, physical concern about things at that time. The secondary concern, though, was programmatic. Uh, the program had been started by President Nixon, and at the time we approached his flight, uh, we changed presidents. President Carter was now, he'd come in office in January. And he had canceled the B-1 bomber program as one of his early acts. So we kind of worried a little bit about what his feelings were about aerospace, although that wasn't NASA, obviously. But nevertheless, it's all in the back of your mind. That he, and through the whole uh, presidential campaign, space had not been mentioned much in any of the debates. So we didn't know how he really felt about the space program in general. So that was my concern because we had just announced also an almost two year slip in the first orbital flight. We were having uh, problems with the main engine and also with tiles at the time on the first Columbia, the first flight we were going to fly to orbit. So that was also in the air. We did not have a backup enterprise. We had canceled the second enterprise we had for cost control. So we deleted the backup test vehicle. So I knew we'd set the program back a year, probably 18 months, to get back in line to fl fly this program if I crashed Enterprise or damaged it seriously. So that was my concern, is that if I crashed Enterprise, uh, that might be the end of the shuttle program right there. It was reflected in a comical way somewhat, but the ground crew uh, also felt this. When Gordo and I climbed aboard that day on Free Flight 1, FF1 we called it, to separate the first time we found Polaroid pictures on each side of the ladder. His Polaroid pictures were of people in blue flight suits like we were wearing. They had our helmets on, which was kind of specially marked helmets. So I knew the suit techs had been involved in this. They had <laughs> somebody in their helmets. And, these, and they had the visor down and the, the Oscar mask sort of dangling. And they were sitting on these huge sweepers machines the kind that would sweep Chicago streets or something, <laughs> in a hangar. The saying on either side of these pictures said, if you screw this up, this is your next job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the workers did. We approached that flight, they were worried about their jobs. So anyway, there was a lot of pressure. Uh, fortunately, uh, the orbiter on separation flew better than we expected, really. It was uh, handling qualities one or two. Uh, very easy plan. The other bugaboo you worry about in the first flight, in this case, was ground effect. We do wind tunnel data. I can't really uh, tell you much about ground effect. That's when you're near the ground. How much cushioning you'll have or ballooning. Or even like the Concorde, the Concorde supersonic tend to get sucked into the ground a little bit. So the pilots had to compensate for having too hard a landing. So that's kind of a thing you worry about too, because we didn't have engines to go around. We were glider. So anyway, it turned out to be perfect. And the Orbiter is a nice uh, handling machine, a nice flying machine down in that environment as well. If you set up, you can almost let go hands off and it'll land. So anyway, we had a very successful, uh, successful program. And uh, through the eight flights, we flew the first, uh, that flight we released was only two weeks late from a schedule we'd set two years before. And we completed the program uh, early. We eliminated the number of flights that we had planned. So anyway, I was happy to uh, wind up my uh, flying career on that, on that note. I was scheduled to fly the third orbital flight, and I would have stayed because we had a very exciting mission to go rescue Skylab 
we're going to carry up a kick stage in the payload bay of the shuttle and go dock with Skylab and boost it or de-orbit it more properly than it just it ended up falling in uh, on that mission. And that, that went away and I decided uh, not to stay. I had an opportunity to join the Grumman Corporation running space programs, which I did, and had another 17 years in the business world with Grumman and north of Grumman. So overall, I've been blessed uh, with a, a great career, a lot of good flying days, and uh, a lot of good days even in the business world with, team, with a team, working with a team. So I, I got no complaints where I am today. Thank you. Brett, thank you very much. I really appreciate you sharing your story with me, and I, I found it fascinating and enjoyable. If you're up to it, we'd like to have a little Q&A with the audience. And I, since I got the microphone, I'm going to kick it off with the first question. As a research test pilot, what was your favorite aircraft to fly? Uh, well, I think you got you got to classify aircraft in the categories because the, the handling qualities or how they fly, how they handle, are different. If, for instance, a, uh, a heavy transport deliberately uh, by, by mill specs has uh, certain control forces that are specified. It's obviously not, you're not gonna do acrobatics in it, so it's not very nimble, not very maneuverable, uh, versus a fighter. Uh, so you always have to put them in families of, of, type, of types of aircraft that each handle. And our helicopters obviously are things that shouldn't fly, but uh, they're different again. <laughs> but uh, the, the fighters I flew, uh, and was one actually in reserve, I flew the F-86 in uh, squadron, first squadron, and uh, guard squadron I was in in Oklahoma. And the 86 was uh, just a natural handling flying aircraft, it was pre precision control, it was good for like if you had a track and a pipper or a gunnery to track a target to shoot it. Uh, so all those kind of things are very maneuverable and uh, I, I kind of have to draw the line to a point in the modern aircraft because it was the last, and kind of the 100 series was probably the last where we didn't do all this fancy flying by wire and, and actually controlling through a computer. So today if you evaluate a fighter it might fly very well, but you're really judging how well the software and flight control designer was, you know, how good the algorithms were they put in the computer. So you're not, you're not really judging the basic airframe air, aerodynamics. In fact, most I assume most modern fighters probably without that are unflyable in the old sense of you have cables and pulleys. Uh, so of the generation that you really would feel in the airplane, so to speak, the inherent basic airplane, I consider the 86 uh, probably the the nicest uh, handling performance for that class of any of the fighters I flew. Uh, transports, I actually, believe it or not, I enjoyed mostly the uh, old DC-3. Uh, C-47, uh, actually, Lewis, we had an R-4D, we had a C-47 at Edwards. And I've flown uh, uh, 707, uh, quite a few flights. Uh, flown other heavier aircraft you might consider was the Canberra. Uh, and if, uh, Fitz will let me fly the 747. I should probably tell that uh, <laughs> uh, one day. I went up with Fitz and he let me make some landings in the 747. But uh, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, that was the, that was the best of uh, those kind of those classes. Thank you very much. We've got an audience in the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming to uh, visit today and. Uh, so back in, uh, it was probably like about a decade ago, I saw you in a documentary where you were talking about the lunar module Aquarius and if uh, you were able to, if it was able to come back to Earth, you would have liked to put it up in your backyard because it, it was like your lifeboat. Were you able to save any souvenirs off of it? Uh, we, I, got, I got some things out. Now we actually had a, a disassembly plan of what we might have disassembled. Had we flown a normal mission, because the limbs didn't come back. Uh, in fact, uh, after 11, 11s we left in orbit. Uh, and turned that deliberately before the crew left, we turned off the water cooling, the valve, 
and watched the systems die. So we wanted some Redland data, and we watched as always what pieces of it failed. And uh, after that, we actually, they were deorbited. It was set up to be controlled for the ignition point from the ground, and they uh, actually, it was set to do a burn using the, what was left of the decent engine uh, to uh, uh, an ascent engine to deorbit them, to create meteorite impact similarities, because we left seismometers on all the landing missions. So that was, so our plan, we had a page in the checklist we added in, that was what we were going to bring back. I had tools to take out, for instance, the hand controllers, uh, you know, to, if they allowed me to, I had some other hardware I was going to take out. Uh, but we, we were using the limb right to the 11th hour, so uh, that, that kind of went away. So I did rip all the netting out. They were just snapped on snaps in the wall, so I ripped all the inner wall out. I did the hand controllers, you had an armrest, an armrest you put your hand on, and I uh, pounded those off, used plant tool B, and I uh, pounded those off and uh, gave one to Grumman, that's still at Grumman on display, and one's at the uh, Cradle of Aviation, at that one now, on Long Island. Uh, but th those I extracted. Uh, we had two floodlights in the overhead. I pulled those off, undid the cables, so I had the cables. So I did a minimal disassembly, but we did not bring back as much as other flights did. So I have to comment on um, your answer to Pat Stalker's question. Um, that's from a real handling qualities guy. I'd ask you Cooper Harper's, but I need to give you a task. <laughs> um, so my question um, on Apollo 13, um, obviously you, you, you were doing a lot of things that the, the, the LEM was never designed for, such as using the engines for um, going back to Earth. Interested in how you guys on the crew worked with ground control in negotiating that. You know, did you question their, some of their judgments? Did you do your own calculations? Um, kind of how did that work? Okay. Uh, well, we had no navigation capability at all in our computers. Uh, so <laughs> there, wasn't any, there was no way we could question what the ground gave us to burn. Uh, now, in the command module, the mothership did have a problem. You could do uh, cursory sight, sightings on the uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, and, and Sun to do, uh, but less accurate than what the ground, but we worried about communication failure that you still wanted the possibility to be able to do that on board. Uh, but all the ground solutions used throughout the program for every mid-course, all the burns was all done by ground computation for every flight. Mm -hmm. So it was not unusual for us to take the ground for what they gave us. And uh, like I said, they did some extraordinary uh, thinking to do that speed up burn, for instance, that was new. Uh, they gave us a procedure on how to set the attitude to do the uh, two manual burns where we did it, uh, how to line like they did Jim Lovell, used the cusp of the earth to sight on through a coas, which is kind of like a gun sight he had in the left window, to sight on the earth. And then I was looking through the AOT, optical telescope and the limb, where normally we used to shoot stars, and he did a slow pitch up. And when I saw the sun enter the top view of that instrument, which is about 60 degrees up, I said, stop, and Jim froze the attitude there. And I quickly did a 400 plus one in the abort guidance system, which we briefly turned on. That gave us needles, steering, steering needles on the eight ball. Two yellow, they're kind of like an ILS in an aircraft. And then if we held those needles set, we were holding the attitude. So unlike the movie where it showed the earth going up and down, by the loose control. <laughs> Two of those maneuvers we did, and we did not even deviate one degree <laughs> on either of those manually. The big computer, incidentally, on board, amazes some people, it was one less, less than one tenth of a megabyte. So that was the memory uh, we went to the moon with. Uh, ground control, uh, mission control, had five banks of IBM 360 75s. That gave them five megabytes. Each, each <laughs> row of those five foot cabinets gave them about one megabyte of uh, capability. So that's what the ground had. Hi.
given your incredible experience and career, what advice do you have for us as we shape the future of aviation and uh, space travel? Well, I hope we continue, as, as I've now set out, the exploration uh, on whatever, uh, whatever pace is dictated. And of course, that's dictated by, in the case of NASA, how you fund it. And that's uh, that kind of is what's driving, driving this boat, is the, the monies you got available. And so you got to keep trying to do the, as much as you can with what you got, and hoping that there's some set of conditions and there was a special set of conditions that set off the Apollo program. That uh, all, all aligned, right? The right leadership, the Russian threat. Uh, we had the uh, no, no major thing drawing great funds at that point. Korea, the Vietnam War had not built up uh, that much at that point. And uh, we had roughly the technology that was thought to could pull it off. So all those things aligned to, for probably the only time since then, NASA has had what I'd call full program plan funding plus. Apollo was the last occasion. Uh, early shuttle, we struggled with funding levels. As I told you, we deleted the second enterprise. Uh, OV-99 was a test vehicle tested at this Lockheed facility here at Palmdale. And we, del we de uh, cut off the structural test at 80% loads and mathematically extrapolated and turned that hull, OB-99, into a flight vehicle that became Challenger, the one we lost on launch. So we saved building another vehicle, in essence, at the hull at least. Uh, we seriously deleted the test articles on shuttle. So I mean, it fought through trying to make, trying to hold schedule uh, and take things out of the program. You can think you can convince yourself are safe enough, not too much risk and still try to hold schedule. So that's the kind of battle it's been with every program. And of course, uh, the program uh, before to go to the moon under Bush, uh, as you know, fell, fell astray under Obama. And that's what you worry about presidential changes. He decided the monies uh, that would be required weren't worth it, and consolation got killed uh, at that time. So that's a constant, uh, as a, as a political side of these things to, to uh, try to make sure everything's aligned uh, to move forward. But I, I hope it's, a, it's sort of part of our uh, psyche that uh, agencies like NASA or even work going on elsewhere continues to look at uh, inventing the new things uh, to moving out and exploration. Uh, I don't know, some, some people have kind of bought into the philosophy uh, that probably is true that uh, sooner or later we'll have another extinction period on Earth, so a long, long, long range you need to worry about do we preserve the human race? Because uh, we may not all be around here forever. So anyway, that, anyway, I think it's a useful uh, enterprise for humans, a good side of humans to uh, be an exploration business. Uh, it's, to me it's worthwhile the investment. Uh, this question is uh, regarding the 13th also, uh, uh, and uh, atmospheric re-entry. Uh, I saw a documentary uh, fairly recently that said the blackout period uh, for communications was exceptionally long on the 13th, and uh, just wondered if that was an issue that the, the documentary uh, showed a lot of guys sweating uh, in the control room on the ground. Were you guys sweating also uh, on board? Uh, certainly it's true that people on the ground were sweating. We were not, we, we really don't, on board we didn't worry much about blackout. On board you're doing, uh, in, mod in the case of the computer control, even Jack was still busy and Jim monitoring the trajectory. I was just kind of viewing the sights, really, in the right couch position, uh, out the back window doing entry. But uh, you're not worried about blackout because anything really bad happens at that point, in that particular time, you're going to have to handle it on board. You're not going to depend on mission control. So we were not even aware of that. Uh, at least I wasn't. 
And but you're right, people on the ground worried that the heat shield had had a problem or something like that that we we, we were lost maybe. Now Jim Lovell explains it to told Ron Howard. Well, we just did that. We didn't answer him because it'd be a good thing in the movie. But <laughs> <laughs> joking, that wasn't the case. <laughs> Nobody's ever explained that though. Chuck Dietrich, who was one of the FIDOs, did some uh, analysis later and felt we ended up shallow. We had a, the water sublimator in the limb, uh, which is part of the cooling system, did produce a little bit of thrust in, in, in that process that he felt still, even though we did those mid-courses one late, it maybe shallowed the trajectory a bit. Hmm. It's still hard to explain the amount of time. Yes, good, to you. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Hayes. I was just curious, with your history in aerospace and your career of tremendous achievement, I was just curious if there's somebody that you personally looked up to or that you admired in the business world, the aerospace world, or even in like the space program that you always kind of had a real like admiration for. Uh, if you, well, if you go way back uh, as a youth, uh, I mean, the, the people I admired was where I ended up initially thinking I had a career uh, was in, in the newspaper business and journalism. Uh, Mr. E.P. Wilkes was the, uh, had a privately owned uh, newspaper on the Mississippi coast where I grew up. And I was a newsboy and later an office boy and later a cover reporter. And he was also my scoutmaster. And uh, so he, he, he and then my experience in high school on the newspaper, working on the newspaper, sports editor, got me interested in that direction. The first two years of college, that was my major, was journalism. I had the thought of continuing uh, to go to the University of Missouri, which was at that time, a, and still is, a, a very well-known school for journalism and, and media. So uh, that was my plan. and. Uh, I had no interest in flying, uh, had, uh, of course, space program went around, so you couldn't have an answer to space. And uh, so the, the Korean War is what got me in, uh, to call it the right direction, uh, because I served, wanted to serve, and my dad uh, always said I should become an officer, get a commission. He had been in the Merchant Marine, he had ran away from home at 16 and joined the Merchant Marine for about uh, 10 or 15 years and uh, initially shoveling coal in the boilers, the old steam <laughs> uh, ships back then. And uh, then he was in the Navy during World War II. And uh, so he, he was his chief machinist mate. And he said he should try to get a commission. And I looked around, and at the time, my age of 18 and two years of college, the uh, only program I fit into was the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. Uh, the Air Force required you to be 19 at the time. So I signed up and joined, never having been in an airplane in my life, not even sitting on the ground. Uh, but at 18 years old, you don't always think too much about what you're getting into. <laughs> you get into. But it was one of these things when the first time I flew, Hank Chenard was my uh, flight instructor, that first flight, it was like magic. Uh, and I said, this is my career. It's going to be in aviation. Somehow, I didn't have obviously a clear set of goals yet, uh, how, what it was going to be, but my life was not going to be flying. Somehow, somewhere. So that's what, this was a 90 degree turn and uh, where I thought I was heading. A lot of people at my uh, in the space program uh, was uh, George Lowe, a name, uh, Bill Tyndall, names most of you may not know. Uh, here was uh, uh, Paul Bickle, was the flight director here at uh, Flight Research Center. Joe, Joe Walker was Don and I's boss at the time. So we had, we had a lot of people uh, to admire and that were kind of mentors for us along the way. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was super interesting. And the question that I have is about Apollo 8. So, 
Um, as a backup crew member, um, if I recall correctly, you were one of the last persons to farewell uh, the three astronauts, uh, Borman, uh, Lobo, and Landers. So um, I guess for me, when, when I hear about that, I feel that it will be like a really special moment, especially being the first persons to head to the moon and leave Earth orbit in a mission. Uh, could you explain, tell uh, maybe a little bit more of detail on that moment and how it was, how were your feelings, and especially how did you see the astronauts, how did you see them, what were they doing? Okay. Uh, I, was, I was a part of the backup crew was how I got in that position under a gun wind. Uh, there were six people involved that uh, earlier in the, in the, day, the, the day before, late in the day uh, before the launch morning, I went out to the spacecraft and get through several roadblocks and I did uh, a 461 step procedure to ready the cockpit for the crew, for them to get there so everything was set up. And then I went back to get a few hours sleep. I didn't get back to the crew quarters till about 9 or 10 at night and woke up at 2.30 in the morning. Deke, Deke uh, missed my call. I, I was so pumped up, I woke up on my, on my own at 2.30 before Deke woke me up. And now it was to go back out to go meet the closeout crew at a uh, trailer by the Launch Control Center. And again, through a couple of roadblocks to get there and join Gunner. And then we went out as a team, six of us. Well, not six of us, four of us. Because two suit techs were going to accompany the astronauts out when they came out in the bay. So the four of us went out to the launch pad uh, to get everything set up and ready for the crew to arrive. And so I, my only role during that period, frankly, was to help the suit techs and give them the straps and stuff to hook up and the hoses to get them to hook up the astronauts and their land and the couches to get them all hooked up and strapped in. And then the last thing I did was crawl underneath. I had to go down. I was in the lower equipment bay. So I had to crawl underneath the couches and come up and go up to crawl out the hatch uh, that way before they could close it and check pressure check to let them go. I can only say it was obvious. Uh, I actually saw Bill Landers when I got up at 2.30. Uh, they were uh, fixing to go to breakfast. And uh, so I, I could tell Bill was really hyped up. He was, he was excited and ready to go. And that was obviously the way of the crew. It's, uh, I assume it would be like any, any big event. You've worked hard to get there and you're uh, excited because you're now, now finally going to get to do what you planned and trained to do. And I did the same thing on Apollo 11, incidentally. I was part of the closeout crew uh, for the Apollo 11 launch. Once again, Fred, I'd like to thank you very, very much. It's uh, been a pleasure, I think. I'd like to thank all our distinguished guests as well for coming out to this presentation. It's good to see Marie again and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much. I have a couple of achievement coins. They're the Armstrong and Dryden achievement coin. It's got the X-15 on it and a little piece of X-15 inside it. I'd like to give those two as a token of our appreciation. I'd like to thank all the audience for coming and for, for politely listening and questioning Mr. Hayes. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you very, very much.